Hello and welcome to the Osteoarthritis Action Alliance Lunch and Learn webinar for October 21st, 2020. Our presenters today are Dr. Catherine M. Colossa and Dr. Tova Wolf. Dr. Colossa is a professor emeritus in the Brody School of Medicine at East Carolina University. She earned her PhD in food science from the University of Tennessee, Knoxville, and is a past president of the Society for Nutrition Education and Behavior. She received the American Academy of Nutrition and Dietetic Association's Medallion Award in recognition of outstanding service and leadership to the dietetics profession and was elected as a fellow of the American Society for Nutrition for a distinguished career in nutrition. Dr. Colossus' career spanned research, teaching, and services in international nutrition, nutrition in prevention and treatment of chronic conditions, obesity prevention and treatment in both adults and children, and medical nutrition education. Dr. Tova Wolf is an assistant professor in the Department of Nutrition and Dietetics at Western Carolina University, where she teaches advanced nutrition and nutrition counseling. She earned her PhD in nutritional sciences at Iowa State University. Her research interests are in the interprofessional approach to support people with healthy aging. Prior to her graduate training, she was a practicing registered dietitian nutritionist in the Metro DC area. Dr. Wolf is a member of the Society for Nutrition, Education, and Behavior and a member of its Healthy Aging and Public Health Practice Group. She also belongs to the American Society for Nutrition, the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, and the Southern Gerontological Society. The title of today's presentation is, Should I Go Mediterranean? Evidence-Based Dietary Strategies to Reduce Pain and Improve Function and Quality of Life. Morning, or I guess it's lunchtime. I hope you have something nice and healthy in front of you. Uh, I had mine just before I started. This is Kathy Colossa, and I'm going to start out, and Tova and I are going to switch back and forth a little bit. I want you to know that we are both scientists, but today we're wearing our nutrition education hats. And the Society for Nutrition, Education, and Behavior is a professional organization dedicated to effective nutrition education and healthy behaviors through research, policy, practice. And we have a vision of healthy communities, food systems, and behaviors. And the society recently joined or, um, uh, with the Alliance, and we're pleased to be presenting on their behalf today. In front of you are the objectives for our session, quickly to talk about strategies, uh, dietary supplements, a little bit about the Mediterranean approach and how you can determine if you're adhering to the Mediterranean approach, and then some nutrition education resources. Next one. We hope that you uh, have already seen this particular Lunch and Learn that was done a, a little bit ago. If not, you might want to um, look at it again. This was a very nicely done science-based presentation about obesity and metabolism and osteoarthritis. A lot, very much thought provoking. What we're gonna do today is something I like to call a wrap, research applied practically. And so we're gonna be focusing on strategies. Next one. It's pretty well agreed in the, in the uh, rheumatology world and in the nutrition world that people who have overweight or obesity and osteoarthritis may benefit from some weight loss. And so that's the first thing we're gonna talk very briefly about is weight loss. The review of literature helps us understand that weight loss leads to reduced pain and improved function. For a while, it wasn't clear how much you needed to lose. And typically, the studies have been showing 10% of a weight loss will give you some improvement in your pain and inflammation, function, improved quality of lowers, but you get even better results if you lose up to 20%. And then, of course, there's a continued gradual improvement if you lose even more than that, if you have it to lose. The research also has demonstrated um, there are different ways you can lose weight. You can use it, lose weight by restricting calories through food. All by itself, you can lose weight. You can restrict calories and use some meal replacements that help you restrict your food intake, shakes and other kinds of things. And that can lead to that, weight, that amount of weight loss. Um, the osteoarthritis doesn't keep you from exercising, uh, can also lead to significant weight loss. Next slide. All right. Thank you, Kathy. And this is Tova. 
And I'm going to talk about just what Kathy had touched on. Um, one of the methods um, that can be used uh, for weight loss, and this is a great example of a um, article that does that. And this is out of Wake Forest University by Miser and colleagues. And they had three different groups of people. And so this is um, out of the IDEA trial. And so they have three groups, exercise group, intensive dietary restriction plus exercise, and um, intensive dietary restriction only. And so as you'll see how they did this, they used the meal replacement method to start. And so to start, they did two meal replacement shakes per day. And then they had a dinner meal that was five to 700 calories that was low in fats, high in vegetables and tailored to user preferences and energy needs. And as their meals started to, um, as their dinner was uh, looking like this, over time in the study, they uh, decreased the meal replacement. So this was over 18 months, and you can see that down here in the x-axis, and on the y-axis is the percent weight loss. The dark uh, triangles is the diet plus exercise group, and the diet only group is the um, the lighter squares. And so if you look, you'll notice that over 18 months, both had um, that weight loss. And you'll notice that the diet only group um, was right around 20%. Uh, oh, excuse me. I'm reading this wrong. This is in pounds over here. And this is percent over here. And you'll see the diet and exercise here is around 10%. And the diet only uh, was really close, right around 9%. So some people may choose uh, to, to use a meal replacement to help aid in that weight loss and, 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 uh, while making those dietary changes. What the literature doesn't tell us on those weight loss trials, or they don't describe very well, are the types of diets that people followed. And of course, Tova and I as nutritionists are very much concerned that we just don't lose weight by restricting calories, but maintain the quality of your diet. What you won't find in the rheumatology literature is very much discussion of the type of diet that might or might not help uh, your pain and function. This literature is fairly limited and it's fairly new, but we believe that there's enough evidence that it's good enough to offer to your patients or to yourself or to your clients, consider following an anti-inflammatory approach. And the Mediterranean is the one that seems to be most popular. There are data related to quality of life in patients with osteoarthritis. And there is some even newer data from the DASH dietary approach about people who adhere to it having greater reduction in pain and improvement in function. Uh, I want you to also note that there is a newer diet that is in clinical trials right now that helps reduce or slows cognitive decline, which is of interest to many of uh, the aging people. And they are a com that diet is a combination of the Mediterranean and DASH. It's not yet been studied in osteoarthritis, but it does uh, demonstrate improvement in memory. Next slide. So we're going to talk about the Mediterranean diet, and this is Tova's slide actually that shows that there is no single one Mediterranean diet, that it varies uh, quite a bit from country to country. And then if you take the Mediterranean diet and bring it to the United States, it varies even more. But generally speaking, the total fat is 25 to 35% of calories. The saturated fat is 7 to 8% of calories. Um, and so it is a diet that is high in fruits and vegetables and uh, ha has some nice uh, impact in the health and well-being of people around the world. Next slide. Particularly important people think about is the quality of the fat that you're doing as you uh, restrict your calories and lose your weight if that's what you're about. And you'll notice in this slide that there is some evidence. Again, it's not overwhelming yet, and that's why you don't really see it in the recommendations, that sat, if you decrease your saturated fat, uh, you're going to improve your pain and, and improve your function. If you uh, have a diet that's higher in polyunsaturated fat, you're going to decrease pain and increase function. 
omega-3 fatty acids, decrease pain, increase function. And then monounsaturated fat, they're actually thinking about and have demonstrated some retarding of the cartilage destruction. Uh, the study really talks about olive oil that we've seen, but I'm throwing in there canola oil as well. If you look at the charts of dietary fats, you're gonna find that the amount of monounsaturated fat in canola oil, although not as much as in uh, olive oil, is still a pretty good contributor of, of um, monounsaturated fat. So we keep in mind the quality of the fats and that fats all do vary in the amount of saturated versus unsaturated fats. Next slide. A couple of studies have looked at the amount of carbohydrate, and of course, this is big in the weight loss uh, area. And my main takeaway point from this is, even if you restrict your, your carbohydrates as they did in this first study to uh, less than 40 grams of carbohydrates a day, you might be losing weight and you might lose it quickly, but you cannot sustain that level of carbohydrates for a long time. And so working with people who have osteoarthritis or or they themselves are looking at do you might want to try a low carbohydrate diet for a short period of time, but recognize that if you're going to use diet to control your pain and improve your function, you need to do it most every day. And so the dietary recommendations for carbohydrate is 130 to 160 grams of carbs a day. You can't do that. Um, you can't do the 20 to 40 without being confused, tired, or have other side effects. Next one. All right, so what does it take to go Mediterranean in, in the United States? So the uh, image on the left, that is pulled right out of the 2015 Dietary Guidelines for Americans. That's a nice visual to show you how the food pyramid compares to the Mediterranean diet to DASH eating on a cups ounce and gram basis. Um, so you will notice absolutely some similarities here um, between these two and it's these two that's a combination of the mind diet that Kathy um, talked about. This right here on the right is an example of a Mediterranean uh, food pyramid and you'll notice this maybe looks different from a lot of uh, food pyramids that you've seen and you'll notice that it's broken up. It's ample in fruits and vegetables um, we see uh, nuts and legumes, um, and as we go higher in this pyramid, we notice that the portions or the recommendations become smaller, and we start to, to see things like up here in the left, red meat and butter used sparingly. Um, it talks about those refined uh, carbohydrates, so things like white rice, white bread, potatoes, pastas, and sweets used sparingly. Um, and we also notice things like um, alcohol, um, having it in moderation. Um, so um, and you'll notice too on some images that show Mediterranean eating water added. And so you might be wondering how um, do I, I use this? So we think that a plate, a visual plate, is a great starting point. And if you click on the link that Katie sent, uh, this is included on your handouts. And so it's a great way to start exploring the Mediterranean eating approach. So you or healthcare uh, providers can give this to the patients and, and they might think, and it might be easy for the patient to start. Um, and this is out of uh, Vident Health. Um, and if we go back to the study that I talked about, applying the Miser study I explained, so for people who maybe this this real lift for them to do three, three times a day and they're you know, looking for weight loss, small steps to get to this point um, and to gradually work towards it. All right, so here's another way that it's pictured and this is one of the uh, resources that we listed, a, a great resource. And so we want to emphasize um, just the key points of Mediterranean eating. So the Mediterranean eating approach includes a large amount of plant sources. And because a patient often feels full, um, or people who follow this eating pattern often do or may feel full because um, they're eating lots of fiber <laughs> um, and it's uh, typically more fiber than following a traditional Western diet. 
Although this, um, this type of eating approach is minimally processed, fresh, locally grown, um, and, uh, but here in everywhere, we can still get lots of nutrition and benefit from canned, frozen, and dried fruits and vegetables, uh, especially for people who are on a budget. But if we think about it, um, we can get lots of nutrition out of those sources. Uh, frozen foods, especially too, are usually um, uh, frozen uh, on site. This approach might be slightly higher in fat than previously recommended by the American Heart Association, but the emphasis with this eating plan is using healthy fats, uh, like Kathy just mentioned, of olive and canola oil. Moderate amount of lower fat cheeses and low or no fat yogurt are recommended for their calcium. Although data do not support the use of supplementing omega-3 fatty acid for cardiovascular health, the American Heart Association, uh, Association recommends meals per week. This approach um, includes a moderate consumption of wine. Um, no, when they're using portions of wine, that's five ounces. <laughs> and no more than one drink uh, for five ounces for women. Uh, two for, for male, which if we rope in the uh, dietary guideline. Okay, um, this is another method that you can use, and this is also out of Vident Health. And um, to, to see if you are adhering to the Mediterranean eating plan. So if you read across the top, you'll notice um, there's this point system. And then if you look at the column on the left, you'll notice these food groups. So this is a great way to test to see if you <laughs> are following the Mediterranean eating approach or how close you are to following it. So you just go across and you circle how many portions per day. And once um, you, and you can use what you think is a portion. And once you have completed that, you add up your points to the bottom here. Oops, sorry. And so, if you add up your points and you're around 33 to 44, you're following the Mediterranean eating plan. If you score between 11 and 32, there are some changes you need to make to eat the Mediterranean way. And if you total zero to 10, you have many changes to make uh, to the Mediterranean eating plan. Um, just wanna emphasize taking small, simple steps towards med eating for you or your patient's goal is more adequate than trackable all this at once. And so after you figure out how to use the plate me method or the adherence table we just showed you, um, here are seven easy steps and you can pick one that you wanna work on first. And I encourage you or your patients to only focus on one step at a time. And um, there are lots of resources on how to do that. And um, I, this, um, and I will share those shortly and this came from the Meds Not Meds website, which we'll talk about. So what are those seven steps? Eat your protein, swap your fats, eat more vegetables, eat more fruit, snack on nuts and seeds, make your grains whole, and rethink those sweets. And so if you're more of a visual person, you don't wanna read the prior slide, if you go to the medsinstedofmeds.com website, which is out of um, NC State by Carolyn Dunn, uh, department head, and, and a, a great resource, a validated tool. <laughs> uh, I highly encourage you to go to this website. It has so much information. And one is these videos. So it's about two to three minutes long. And this will explain each of the seven steps. And um, so if you're a visual person, I highly recommend this out or your patients or clients. All right, so how can you further assist your patients or yourself? We absolutely embrace <laughs> referring to an RDN if possible, if available, when user using lower calorie diets, and if your patient is interested in learning the ways of medical eating. Actually, in most states, if you go to this link right here, uh, you can find um, a dietitian. Um, the best way to personalize Mediterranean eating to your patient's needs is preferences, budget, um, many other things come into play to see how elements of their current eating pattern may be able to be incorporated into Mediterranean eating. 
And the great thing about, um, we've pushed really hard in our field, many insurance policies cover our DM visits, especially if the individual needs to lose weight. So uh, make sure to check with your insurance company and encourage your patients to check with insurance companies. All right, so I just thought um, now would be a good time to transition to um, a case. So let's think about Dan. And Dan, um, this is what he typically eats in a day. Uh, say for breakfast, he has a stack of pancakes, lunch, this sub sandwich, and a grab bag of chips. For dinner, he typically has a plate full of pasta with marinara and meatballs, and he always has dessert. And also throughout the day in his work drawer, he has a mini potato bag of chips, and um, he snacks on Reese's Pieces throughout the day. Can you think of ideas on how he might pick a simple step to incorporate in Mediterranean eating? Yeah, so you might be thinking he might benefit from seeing that plate. Or if we think about the seven steps of the Med Way, perhaps he'd want to rethink his sweets. Perhaps um, he would want to Think about adding more fruit or maybe replacing some of those desserts with fruit. He said that he snacks on Reese's Pieces throughout the day. Well, I would guess that Dan, if he likes Reese's Pieces, he probably likes nuts and seeds. So maybe he would want to um, snack on that. Um, so many ways that, that Dan can um, do one step at a time before he, he progresses to another if he's interested in um, the med way. All right, so after this talk, you might be thinking, should I go Mediterranean? The evidence is strong and is very encouraging. There's really been yet uh, evidence to prove negative consequences to following this eating plan. So it's been, um, it's decreased oxidative stress and knee arth osteoarthritis, um, many showing by de decreasing interleukin-6 levels and, other anti um, and another pro-inflammatory markers. It is effective for weight loss in overweight and obese individuals. Long-term weight loss of 10 to nearly 20% of baseline improves health-related quality of life while reducing pain and increasing function. Also, um, I'm not sure if you saw the US News World Report, but the Mediterranean eating um, diet was considered the best overall diet and the easiest to follow. And the focus of this talk is osteoarthritis, but I just wanted to say that there has been other um, evidence-based research to show the um, benefit reducing cardiovascular disease, uh, decreases some risks of some type of cancers, um, pr protective against uh, cognitive decline, and also decreases the risk of type two diabetes. In our business, we uh, can't talk about food without us having people ask us questions about dietary supplements. And I just want to make a couple quick comments. The uh, American College of Rheumatology and Arthritis Clinical Practice Guidelines do make a couple comments. They recommend against fish oil, vitamin D, um, and uh, glucosamine. And they do so show that there may be some benefit for some people with hand um, osteoarthritis with the chondroitin. Next slide. What I do really want to focus in on this particular slide is that there, the story still is not quite settled about glucosamine and chondroitin. You're going to have patients who uh, tell you that they have a benefit from taking it. The literature continues to be a little bit mixed. Here's a reference for a, a new study that basically says we don't know who will or who will not be benefited by it. And then there's, of course, interest in uh, turmeric and curcumin, which, interesting to me, is also being talked about a lot in cognitive decline slowing. The problem with it is if you're going to use it as a food in a spice, you have to use it every day, and most of us don't do that much cooking with those two spices or that one spice. Uh, and when it comes to the dietary supplement at this point, we still don't know what the frequency and the formula needs to be. Next slide. The literature is looking at all kinds of various types of things like drinks and uh, fruits and bowls and fish oils and vitamin C and vitamin D. And while the college does not recommend the vitamin D, we clearly see a large number of people, even in a sunny state like North Carolina, where vitamin D deficiency is quite uh, widespread 
and particularly in people who don't get outside, uh, who might be restricted in their movement. And so definitely vitamin D is important if you have a deficiency. Next slide. The dietary supplement label has changed. So if you're used to just sending people to uh, buy a supplement of any kind, you may want to take a look at the new label so you can explain it better to them. And the next slide. A particularly important change is that vitamin D is now required to be listed as a microgram rather than in IUs. Some manufacturers are still using IUs, but if you've been giving your patients or if you yourself have been looking for a vitamin D product that has an IU on it, you will have a completely different dose, at least sounding dose, than if you're going to do it in micrograms. So make sure that you're buying and using the right kind of product. And uh, our caution always is to buy a high quality product because there are so many things that are not. Next slide. All right, and here's uh, resources we use in the slide, but just a great place to get started to find more accurate information on Mediterranean eating. So we have those quick links for you. Um, if this is something that you or your, your patients are, are interested in, in trying. All right, we want to thank SNEB and OAA for having us, and um, we want to thank you all for attending. And um, right now we're gonna open it up for questions. That's right, thank you all. Thank you, Dr. Kalasa and Dr. Wolf for that fantastic presentation. We get a lot of um, questions from people with osteoarthritis about diet and nutrition, so it's really nice to be able to add this presentation to our resources. Um, we are gonna go ahead and, and take some questions. I know uh, that some of you may may need to leave, um, and that's completely fine, um, but we will stay on to try to get some questions answered. And if you have to leave, you can refer back to the presentation um, at a later date once that recording is available. I had a couple of uh, questions come in prior to um, today's presentation. I'm gonna start with those. Um, first of all, uh, what is the difference between a plant-based diet and the Mediterranean diet? All right, thank you, Katie. I'll take that, that's a great question. Um, so we, I think it's great to emphasize that Mediterranean eating and DASH eating and mind eating, they are plant-based. Um, in these types of eating patterns, most of the calories come from the healthy fats, the grains, the fruits, and uh, the veggies. Uh, there are other uh, plant-based eating patterns that, uh, out there. Does that help answer your question? Yes. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and someone, someone did ask if we were going to uh, be sending out the slides, and uh, the presenters have agreed to send out their slides. So I will be um, sharing a PDF of today's presentation with uh, the recording link when I email that out later this week. Uh, so someone asked, uh, with the Mediterranean diet, what is recommended for people who do not like fish and seafood? Kathy, I'll let you take that one. <laughs> All right. Well, there are certainly a source of omega-3 fatty acids that, that, that are plant-based, and we don't have a list up here, um, but you can easily uh, Google that if you, you need them, or, or um, maybe we can add it to what, what uh, Katie is sending out. That's so that's great. one of the, the, the um, choices to do is to, to look, look at that. I will tell you that with the studies that are going on with the MIND diet, it turns out that you only need one fish meal a day to uh, a week to, to get the kind of benefits from omega-3 fatty acids. It's the heart disease that talks about two fish meals a week. So it must be in there somewhere in between. So uh, many folks have taken quite um, comfort that they don't have to eat as much fish as, as, as noted. We also need to really emphasize that the closer you come to that, it, uh, diet, the better your outcomes, but you will get benefit from doing any parts of it. So if you don't really can't eat fish, don't like fish, then upping your grains, upping your fruits and vegetables. Um, some people like soy products instead. They can do that instead of the, the fish. 
And I think, I think that kind of gets at um, one of the questions I see a little bit later, how does gluten-free work in the Mediterranean diet? Well, there are plenty of today, you know, if you ask this question 15 years ago, it was really difficult to do a gluten-free diet, but there are so many products out there available. There's so many more grains available to Americans um, compared to what you had before that, that were typically uh, available that it actually isn't that hard to do this in a, in a gluten-free way. Okay. And another, and I noticed that, uh, how do you, Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Go, Go ahead, ahead, Katie. Sorry. So I was just going to, the, there were a couple of questions about eggs, and it looks like um, someone said you're recommending not to eat eggs, and then someone else said, what are your thoughts about eating egg whites versus whole eggs? Oh, uh, well, if you look at the chart, you'll see that there are eggs on that adherence chart, and that the recommendation um, is uh, um, less than four a week. If you are actually eating the egg white, that's the protein part. Uh, the part of the saturated fat is in the yolk, so you would, in fact, if you want to eat the egg white versus the egg yolk. Uh, if your diet is not high in saturated fat, mine is not, so I eat the whole egg and I eat seven a week. I do as well, Kathy. <laughs> They're inexpensive. Uh, comparatively, considering today's food prices and uh, the quality of the of the protein is really good. Uh, do you recommend keeping a food journal and tracking micronutrients? I can take that one, Kathy, if you want. Alrighty. Um, absolutely, if you if, if that would benefit you. Um, some some people do really benefit from when they're starting to tackle um, nutrition changes, tracking their food. If you are looking um, for a radical diet change in what you're currently doing, I would highly recommend to see if there's a click on that link to see if there's a, a dietitian in the area uh, to try to help you. Um, so just having worked with a lot of people, some of the apps are accurate with um, micronutrients. And some of them are not. <laughs> um, so it's really important to make sure that if you are using an app or you're looking it up, um, that hopefully you're getting accurate information. And it can be really quite tedious to follow micronutrients. If, if you wanna take on that task, you totally can, um, or you can bring in a professional um, to help you do that. But some people like to do food logs um, to track to see what they're doing to day to day, how they felt when they were eating it, um, and they might try to do, you know, one change a month, um, one dietary change a month or one dietary change a week. Um, so yeah, it's really up to you. A lot of people uh, do find it beneficial to track what they eat if they're trying to make dietary changes. Let, right. let, me, let me add to that, that if uh, we're talking about seniors, the, one, the nutrients that might typically be low if you are eating less, uh, if you're managing your caloric intake are vitamin B12, calcium, vitamin D, and, and omega-3s. So if you were tracking, if you were wanting to just track a few, those would be the right. ones that would make the most sense to do. Or as if Tova mentioned, if you've radically made a change, if you've gone from eating a lot of meat to now being a vegetarian or even a vegan, you may need to check those same uh, nutrients to see that you're getting enough. And uh, while we're on that, that topic, um, do you have any recommendations of good apps to use to track your diet? My, uh, our medical students use MyFitnessPal. They tend to really like that one. USDA used to have a really good site, but they took it down. So <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> we struggle a little. Probably in the case a lot of um, in the case of a lot of different behavior uh, change, whatever is going to be the thing that works for you. <laughs> right. Yes, and uh, I have I had some students do a great presentation last semester on all those apps, and some of the apps actually pull from the USD database, which I think is really cool. Um, so feel free to send me an email if you want a list of apps. <laughs> a couple of recommendations here for my fitness pal. Um, so that seems to work for some people. And we're gonna take two more questions that I see here in the chat. Um, first of all, uh, what recommendations do you have for clients who may be limited in their ability to prepare foods and or chew foods? 
I, I deal with this quite a bit with uh, patients. Well, I don't see patients directly anymore, but I had. And what we often do is suggest people sl uh, move slowly, plan mm -hmm. a recipe that is fairly easy to make, build in rest breaks, so that if you really have, if your hands are hurting or you have pain in other places that you don't try to run around the kitchen and do it very quickly. So that's, that's one of the strategies that, that helps a lot of people. They just don't think about that they could do it over a, a period of time. Um, chewing, have you got any ideas, Tova? Yes, so when I worked with some older adults and aging adults, some find it very valuable when they are feeling good to select a day or a day or two that they are feeling less pain and, and perhaps more mobility and to help prepare meals for the week. Um, using something like a slow cooker <laughs> or a crock pot um, can help. Um, if you're someone and you're having a hard time, you know, chopping fresh vegetables or fruit, you can nowadays buy frozen pre-chopped about anything. <laughs> um, so highly encourage you to do that. And there are, um, when you are having things that are protein, it may be tougher to chew. You can try things using like ground um, fish, typically very tender. Um, you can do other proteins uh, source, uh, sources like tofu is, is typically very soft. Um, there's a, a variety of, of, of things you can do. And I, um, I highly recommend if you're, you have patients or you're someone who is looking on how to adapt to those changes, um, seeing if there is a registered dietitian nutritionist in the area to help um, adapt and make and help those changes. And also there's adaptive devices you can get to that can help make cutting um, easier. Katie, I saw that quick question about how do you know a quality vitamin on a slide that uh, shows my mom actually oh, wow. with, her, with her vitamins oh. <laughs> and, and the pharmacy store. You see NSF, uh, uh, USP, or Consumer Lab. Those three kind of um, symbols on the product will guarantee you that at least the product inside is what is on the label. I, and I agree with Kathy. I, uh, one of my jobs, I worked at a, a, a supplement company, a protein and vitamin company. And I always appreciate when companies have the certificate of analysis saying, this is what's in my product, and we frequently test it. Because if they change where they're buying um, their vitamin sources, um, it, it might be different. And so it's, yeah, and like the certifications Kathy said as well. Well, that's great. Thank you so much, Dr. Wolf and Dr. Colossa for staying on for these um, questions, some really good questions, some great discussion. Thank you everyone for joining us today. I'm gonna um, put out a quick poll if you have time to just answer a few questions before you leave. And I will put in a plug here for our next month's presentation, which will be on November 18th. And our presenter will be Charla Johnson of the Movement is Life organization and her uh, presentation is titled, How Osteoarthritis Treatment Can Become a Shared Decision. So thank you all very much for joining us today and that concludes our presentation.